working in food is amazing. It satisfies a lot of things for me. It satisfies, you know, creativity. It satisfies the fact that if I'm hungry, I can I can cook something and I can eat it. You know, it satisfies、um, my kind of intrinsic need to please people. So, you know, when my customers are happy, I'm happy. This is the crackling. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The melting pot of different cuisines, cooking techniques, and cultural backgrounds has given Australia's culinary landscape a unique, yet rich tapestry. For chefs working with people of different backgrounds, it offers an insight into different ways to cook and get the best out of ingredients. For Victor Leong, the world of fine dining gave him a different lens to look at the food. Of his Malaysian and Chinese heritage, and it's helped him create one of Australia's best restaurants. Victor, you weren't always going to be a chef. Tell us about the moment you realised it was for you. Um, yeah, I think at the start I wanted to pursue、um, a career in finance or, you know, some kind of business management. A kind of field. I wasn't sure what that was, but then you know, looking at what I was good at, you know, I wasn't very good to be fair. You know, I wasn't. I didn't do very well in accounting in university. I, I failed marketing many times. So I'm sitting there going, oh, I don't know. So I think it was just. I think the only kind of avenue left was sales, and I wasn't a huge fan of that. And I think you know, I've always been passionate about about food, and I knew it was something that I had to kind of pursue. You know, once I finished my degree and I still had the opportunity of of doing an apprenticeship, you know, at the probably the right age, you know, probably a late start、um, compared to a majority of the industry. But I felt that if I if I pursued that and you know I didn't I didn't like it after the third or fourth year, at least I'd be you know a qualified chef, and then I'd I'd review my kind of、um, options there. But you know, I think after the first year and a half, I th- I really decided, yeah, this is it. You know, so、um, yeah, I've been passionate about it. So, you know, I, I love working、um, in in food and with food, and you know, in kitchens. And you know,、um, now it's the next stage is working、uh, on projects that set you know food businesses up and stuff. So that's it's come.、Um, Yeah, it's come, it's come full circle, and also now I I actually do a lot more of the business stuff than you know、um, I ever did. So it's it's good fun. Did starting a bit later in the industry、uh, as a chef did, was there advantages for you with that? Well, I th- I think you know I I feel I I I got a slight advantage in terms of like I knew the focus on on areas of the work I wanted to focus on. You know what I mean? Like and. It, it was a little bit, and I knew I didn't have as much time as everyone else, so it was a little bit of a race to get to, you know, like head chef or sous chef or chef de party at the early days. You know what I mean?、Um, and and I knew the kind of the skill sets that I was after, and like a a, a study style, I guess. And I, I I I feel like I gathered that from university a little bit. You know, like if you if you wanted to, to study. And focus on you know one area of a subject matter. You just jumped in and did it, and then you kind of set yourself little kind of markers on what you deemed was、um, you know competent or success- successful, or you know what I mean. And I felt that I did that early in my career to hone in on the the style of food and and the techniques and the skills that I wanted. So I feel that it was a slight advantage in that sense. You mentioned that you always loved food. Tell us about what role food played in your family growing up. Yeah, you know, I、um, I grew up in the inner west of Sydney,、um, in Burwood and Homebush.、Uh, when I was when I was you know、um, early teens, you know, primary school, high school,、um, food was always something that played、um, a significant role. I guess with any kind of second generation migrant family. Um, my, my mother's a very good cook, and、um, we all used to sit down at the dinner table at six thirty every night as a family. And you know, and there's, you know, it was kind of like、um, a place where、uh, mum would, you know, a kind of preserve heritage with some Chinese dishes, b kind of、um, soothe some, you know, lo-、um, homesick pains from you know food that she missed by cooking stuff that you know was from Malaysia where she grew up. And also to、um, explore 
you know, cuisines that are new to the neighborhood. So, so yeah, like, you know, um, I remember mom cooking, you know, Lebanese dishes because um, our land landlady at the time gave us, you know, like tabbouleh and falafels and stuff. And then, you know, Strathfield was a slowly emerging Korean uh, ne- neighborhood. So there was a lot of kind of cultural influences there. So it was a lot of... Um, you know, influences from, you know, neighbors and friends and, you know, other other parents and children from the neighborhood. So it's pretty cool. Pork is a real integral ingredient for Chinese and Malaysian cuisine. Is there any dishes from your youth um, that you can tell us about that you remember? Uh, it's funny you say that because um, mum used to cook uh, sweet and sour pork, but she she didn't like doing it because you'd have to deep fry at home. And that's one thing that's like a bit of a pain in the ass to do. So she used to she used to make a deal with us. It would be like, okay, because um, I have a brother and two sisters. So the, the deal was you can either have Peking duck on your birthday or sweet and sour pork. So we used to we used to talk amongst ourselves and organize it. So it was alternate. You know what I mean? So we'd get one of us would get Peking duck. One of us would get sweet and sour. So we'd eat that twice. So we'd have Peking duck twice a year and uh, sweet and sour pork twice a year. So funny that uh, it's sweet and sour pork, but, you know. And mom used to do it so that she'd deep fry the pork so it was super crispy, and then she'd serve the, serve the sauce on the side. So essentially, she'd basically make two dishes. So um, it was crispy pork neck, like in light batter um, kind of flour dredge, and then deep fried until it was crispy, and then seasoned with like a Cantonese salt and pepper spice. And that was, And then that was served with a, uh, sweet and sour sauce on the side. So if you can, if you add it with the sauce, you get sweet and sour sauce. But if you have it with uh, by itself, you just get salt and pepper pork. So it's pretty good. Tell us about the early days uh, working in commercial kitchens. But what were the real influences early on for you? Uh, I think it went a little bit before that. I was when I was in high school. I, I had a part time job um, working at a local uh, delicatessen. And that was run by um, two really lovely, endearing old uh, Italian ladies. One was uh, from Venice, Manuela, and Rosa was from um, Sicily. So they both had kind of very different ideas of, um, you know, what part, what's the best cuisine in in Italy. But um, the deli was great fun because, um, you know, I got to learn a lot about charcuterie, a lot about how um, different kind of uh, Eastern European and, you know, Southern European cultures enjoy, um, pork, you know, in charcuterie, salami, salumis, you know, um, and then even, um, yeah, some kind of, um, some liverwurst and, you know, that kind of, um, kind of Baltic style, um, you know, pressed and, and kind of cooked sausages and a lot of smoked sausages. So it was good fun. What sort of influence did, did that have on, on you moving forward with food? I think, you know, you, you, when I was that young, I was just really into like serving, serving people from the neighborhood and finding out what the customers liked and then trying these products myself and then figuring out, you know, what, what styles of, um, kind of charcuterie I really liked. You know what I mean? So I think that was a nice foundation of identifying what I thought was delicious and, you know, what kind of worked in different cultures. Um, and then, you know, as, as my career progressed, um, parts of, you know, the, that charcuterie style kind of honed in on a little more technical, more regional, more kind of, um, I guess, you know, chef styled, um, preparations, which, which are pretty cool because then, you know, I had an idea of what these things were and then having been, being taught by, you know, a, a certain chef about how to make a terrine, you know, how to kind of process foie gras, how to make a pate. Um, I already had like a pretty good foundation. Tell us about what it was like working in the kitchen of Galileo at the observatory. Um, yeah, well, Galileo was great. You know, it was kind of the, the last of the big brigade type kitchens. You know, I remember there was like oh, 12 or 16 chefs every service and lunch and dinner seven days a week. Um, and yeah, it was great because, you know, it was one of those kitchens where there was a meat section and that, you know, the meat section had a chef to party and a commie and maybe an apprentice, you know, the fish section had, you know, a chef to party and a commie, you know, the garnish section had like four chefs in there, you know what I mean? Like, um, and then, you know, sauce section had two. So it was really cool to learn, 
you know, when, when you were given, when you were assigned a new section, you really kind of learnt it, you know, and it was just that, you know, it was very kind of, I guess it's the kind of Henry Ford model of, you know, a production production, you know, one person's a specialist in one part. And then when it comes to assemble everything, it all comes up together at the same time. So, you know, learning, um, you know, on the meat section and it was such, it was very classic kind of French run, um, Japanese French type, um, brigade where, you know, if you, if you had like a, um, a beef dish, it would have a veal jus sauce, you know, a pork dish would have like a pork sauce, you know what I mean? So it was every, everything was utilized, you know, uh, framed around the protein and then everything kind of built around that. So it was good to see, you know, um, like a pork dish would go on and then, you know, in, in the French school of um, cuisine, there wouldn't be like a pork bone uh, stock, right? But then in the Japanese school of cuisine, you know, pork stock is everywhere, you know, tonkotsu ramen is a pork stock, you know what I mean? So it was nice to kind of see, you know, um, a utilization of what um, the French school of cooking would say about how to cook the the piece of meat but then like applying a japanese lens on you know maybe the source application or you know the presentation so it was really interesting what sort of influence did that foundation have on on what you do today uh well i think you know all all of the people all of the chefs that i've ever worked under has taught me something and you know i've i've gleaned something from them you know so, some um a little bit more obvious than others but you know i think Haru style of food was, you know, it was very, like, I loved it because it was very technical, you know, he approached um, each dish from like every kind of angle, um, you know, the, the way he, he kind of processed stuff was, you know, a really kind of traditional, masterful way in, in, in the kind of grand, grand chef in a French style would, you know, and I, I really, I really appreciated that, especially in terms of like a formative training. So, yeah, it was good. It was good. You also worked with one of Australia's most renowned chefs, Mark Best, at Mark, with that has the most incredible alumni. You worked with some amazing chefs. Do you have any stories from that time? Um, yeah, I I had probably it was it was the first time I w- uh, worked in a kitchen where um, I ate a. I ate this, we used to we used to do this pork jowl dish, right? And I st- I still use the same technique and how to how to process it because I think it's amazing. Um, and I remember Mark served it, so it was a roasted pork jowl, and yeah, he you know he brined it before and then he cooked it really slowly, and then um, you peel you, you kind of carve the skin off, um, and then you crisp up the skin um, the fat in the pan. And the dish, the dish he had, it was, I, I'll still remember it. It's, it was just served with um, just wilted spinach with an oyster cream, a poached oyster, sesame seeds, and then a sauce that was made um, from roasted duck bones with a port reduction and star anise. And I remember first time having it and I thought this guy is a genius because this is the exact same flavor profile you would get if you went to a Chinese like um, roast meats joint and you order the if you order the roast pork and they serve the roast duck uh, sauce with it and I went this is exactly it and I knew you know then that yeah I'd, I'd like this place I'd like to work here very much <laughs> well the alumni are amazing from that restaurant Do you, what was it like working with that team oh it was great you know I think um, it was a small team so you know I went from Galileo um, to Mark and Mark is yeah I think maximum five six people in there um and yeah the work is really intense um everyone is really talented and it was really it was great it was great it was great to to work in an environment where everyone's kind of um focus was to you know to to be the best and you know we all worked really well together you know and it was a nice team where everyone's kind of personalities kind of worked together you know it was um and yeah we all just full energy and creativity and it was all kind of steered together um from the leadership of you know of passy and you know the vision of mark so it was really um it was great mark best is known for um wanting perfectionism and really pushing people um was it challenging in that kitchen in that sense 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the reasons I really enjoyed working there is because it was challenging, you know, um, and it was also very creative and it was nice that, um, you know, the creativity was kind of taught to all of us, you know, um, then that comes with, you know, a lot of, it's not, there's not a lot of fun doing it when you're doing it because it's, it comes with a lot of rejection and a lot of questioning and a lot of kind of, um, you know, a lot of trying to steer you in a direction and we were all pretty kind of angsty and, and creatively angry. So it was, um, it was, uh, it was good. Yeah. You worked in the Mark Kitchen, which, you know, had five or six chefs working at a time to a kitchen that was absolutely huge in one of the biggest restaurants in Sydney at Mr. Wong. What was it like changing to such a different atmosphere? Yeah, no, it's that, you know, I think when we, we opened Mr. Wong and when we first talked about the project of Mr. Wong, we never realized how big it was going to be. Um, we knew it was going to be big and busy and, <clears throat> Once you kind of start working with, you know, su such a big team, especially in the early days, you know, it was, um, it was, it was a big challenge trying to get the systems right. And, you know, um, you, everyone working together, but, you know, it's, it's a testament of how, 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 how amazing that restaurant is. And just looking at Dan Hong's success, you know what I mean? And what, he, you know, Dan's, Dan's influence on all of us as chefs, um, and as young chefs, you know, back then, um, is amazing just to see, you know, what, what he can achieve and, you know, the kind of kitchens that he can, he can manage and the, the amount of creativity that, that he can have for that kind of scale is amazing. So yeah, it was good, you know, and, and the team was amazing as well, you know, like the, the opening team was, you know, everyone's gone on from that opening team to either, you know, be a head chef or open their own restaurant, which is another kind of testament of, of Dan's, um, ability to kind of, you know, seek out talent and work with them and kind of, you know, build it to the, to the point that, you know, the next step is, you know, own operator or head chef. So it's pretty good. What was the impact like on you? You grew up in a house with the Chinese and Malaysian influence, and then you had the, the heavy backbone of French cookery behind you in your career to suddenly cooking in one of the biggest Cantonese restaurants in the country. What was it like delving into that world for you? Oh, it was great. You know, I think it's one of those things like I, I made a decision to, to kind of explore the food of my heritage and, you know, um, and discover that. And, you know, I, th I think one of the, and I'm lucky to, to be able to work with someone like Dan at the time to, to kind of really, um, explore it in, in a very kind of similar lens, you know what I mean? Um, cause his, his background is, is very similar to mine in terms of, you know, the fine dining um training and you know like he, his passion for food is is amazing and you know the the way he kind of looks at cuisine is really cool as well um you know he's focused on things that are delicious and you know um and creating in that kind of um space is quite fun and also to to explore that you know in that team with with you know his direction and his kind of his lens on how um asian food is because you know it's not just chinese food that dan's an expert at you know with with his years at, at miss g's before and you know his his mother um running successful restaurants it's nice to see to to have it from you know a little bit of a, a hospitality like an experienced hospitality lens you know so um yeah it's great really really good tell us about how lee ho Fook came about um yeah <laughs> Lee Hofuk. Um so yeah, Lee Hofuk came about um well I'm I got introduced to a group of of hospitality operators in Melbourne and at the time they had this empty tenancy on Smith Street in Collingwood and Smith Street's kind of very similar to kind of King Street in Newtown, you know. Um, you know, Bohemian all all the activity kind of happens in the afternoon and late nights. Um, lots of kind of creatives and arts artsy type people in that neighborhood so when i saw the site i thought you know this is pretty cool this would be a nice spot for my first restaurant and then yeah it kind of worked out well because what what the team wanted um was like a, a cool funky kind of creative chinese restaurant that would sit kind of well in a dining uh, landscape and yeah it's funny to think that's eight years ago now uh when it all started so yeah and you know i think it was it was it was nice. It was nice that they, they were, you know, in, they were happy to let me 
um, be creative and and run run with you know whatever ideas I had and and it was it was a good time then for me to kind of just start delving into the the style of food that I wanted to do so um, yeah it's been great. It was during this time as well that you made some great connections with producers as well. Do you have any stories of of um, time spent on um, pork farms at all? Yeah, it's um, I've got. I've got a couple of good ones. Um, one is uh, Judy from Western Plains. She saved my ass how many times and how many functions um, with like, yeah, next day, um, you know, uh, suckling pig and pork deliveries. So shout out to you, Judy. Um, but there was actually an interesting one about three years ago, maybe four years ago now, I had an opportunity to to film a documentary that I don't think actually got any airtime but it's there's yeah there's a roller film somewhere and it was it was this young kind of documentary maker who wanted to kind of do a kind of from start to finish process of like how to get um pork you know out into you know from from basically the paddock to to the plate of the customer right so um and the opportunity arose that we went out to um to this all organic uh farm it's called john a farms out near i think it's near um macedon if i remember correctly but we yeah we we got to to actually yes kill and slaughter a pig and you know and cook it like it was yeah it was full on like you know we're out there for three days it was camping um and it was it was kind of cool because you know we saw the pig and the pig is you know they they raise everything um so close to kind of nature's cycle and you know it was a really happy looking pig um it was a french duroc it was i don't know if you know um uh pig varieties but um and then it was a mobile abattoir that came out um and then we slaughtered the pig um and then yeah just going through the whole process from you know from the gunshot going off to like sticking it to to making you know uh, to collecting the blood and then you know um skinning it and hanging it and then we you know we ate all the offal the first day because you know the, the pig's got to hang and then cooking parts of it um as the next couple of days kind of went on it was amazing it was a really really great experience so obviously the 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 slaughter part was a little bit you know um daunting because it was it was just like okay sorry buddy but oh, good there's some of some of the not like it was a very um kind of educational experience but also like it changed a lot of conceptions of what i had about um yeah how, how kind of animals are, are slaughtered and you know and some awful to be fair like we cooked everything and everything was delicious you know what i mean and i used to be like oh yeah i don't eat I don't eat pork liver. I think it's too kind of um, mealy and too kind of irony. Um, not my kind of thing. But, you know, we, we cooked that liver from that pig. It was amazing. So I guess it's, you know, it, it comes from the, a, a multitude of different things, right? You know, um, but yeah, great. The media have um, had all sorts of views on what you're doing at Lee Ho Fook and the sort of food that you're cooking to modern uh, Cantonese to taking it to a new level. Um, but what's what's your interpretation of what you're doing? Tell us about your cooking. You know, I think the food at Lee Ho Fook is, is evolved, you know, and it has to because, you know, even I've changed. And, you know, my customers have changed and, you know, any, anything that's been around eight years is definitely going to evolve. So I think where we are now, um, yeah, we're a fine dining Chinese restaurant that serves a tasting menu. Um, and we explore, you know, all the regions of China and, um, and then try and incorporate um, some historical factors from, you know, Australia because we're, we're, a Melbourne restaurant that serves Chinese food. So um, that's kind of, we're settling into that, um, that groove at the moment. So yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of, you know, what the team has achieved and, you know, where we are and, and how far we, and how far we've come. So um, yeah, I think we're settling into, you know, kind of more, I don't, I don't really like the terminology of modern or contemporary anything, because you know what we, what we are is, you know what we're living in right now is contemporary you know um because so then it's it's more like oh, i wouldn't say rework classics either it's just yeah we're settling in to our style 
like a, of a new Chinese restaurant, really. So, um, and with with an Australian, like a pretty heavy Australian leaning um, creative lens. Do you have a pork dish or two that you can tell us about that you've had on the menu of late that sort of typifies what you are doing? Oh, it's funny you say that because um, I did have I did have the pork chow dish, which is almost identical to Mark's kind of preparation. Um, with so it was a pork chow, um, slow roasted. Um, the process is the same. We brine it with a brown sugar brine, um, a little bit of garlic, Szechuan peppercorns. Cook that slowly. Take the skin off. Crisp it up. Um, so it tastes kind of like um, it's how, it tastes like a slightly meatier version of the Cantonese suyuk, which is the crispy pork, uh, crispy pork belly, but without the crackling. So it's just this kind of slither of meat, and it's nice with the jowl because you get fat on both sides and like a, a quite a tight muscle in the middle. Um, and then yeah, we just serve that with um, a, a, a Cantonese style um, roast duck sauce. You know, coming because the first time I had it at Mark, I just went, "Yep, this this combination is exactly what I'm." You know, I'm I I remember eating every time I go to a roast duck restaurant. And so we're riffing off that, but we served it with a um, taro and potato milfoy, which is just slices of t- slices of taro, like and you know ten percent of potato to kind of stick it all together. Uh, we cook that with duck fat, press it, and then cut a slice off and and fry it until it's crispy, um, and a little bit of pickled onions through that. So yeah, really really kind of simple. And that was on a lunch lunch menu last season. So yeah, you know we've been in. In the current situation, once we reopen, I think um, the menu is probably going to be a little bit lighter. So that guy's going to probably get on the bench and something uh, a little bit more spring is going to come on. What is it about um, the pig and pork that's so uh, integral and um, versatile in Chinese uh, cuisine? I think it's the, the applications, you know what I mean? It's the variety of textures and um results that you can get you know what i mean like all the way from you make a jelly from the skin you take the je- jelly and you put it into a dumpling to make a soup dumpling you know all the way to you you know you get a tender cut from any anywhere from the neck all the way to the belly you know um the the lean meat of the the shoulder and the leg can be minced nicely you know the fat can be cut up and you know uh, put through um a sausage you know, e- that doesn't even ha- actually have to have pork in it. Like, for example, we make a duck lap chong at Li Hefu in in kind of like a fresh style of sausage. But um, because duck is quite lean, we put pork belly, um, the pork belly and pork fat to it. You know, so um, it's you know it it it, it helps. It, it's a it's a versatile um, meat, and you know it's it just gives <laughs> so much. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Well, what is it that you love about about what you do? Uh, I think what I love all sorts, all, everything about it. I think, you know, I, I like, first I love working with food. You know, I think working with food is amazing. You know, it's the, it, it satisfies a lot of things for me. It satisfies, you know, creativity. It satisfies the fact that if I'm hungry, I can, I can cook something and I can eat it. You know, it satisfies um, my kind of, intrinsic need to please people so you know when my customers are happy i'm happy um i like working in a team of passionate people um you know i like operating in a city with serious hospitality operators you know i like the relationships i have with my suppliers um yeah i like all of it well victor we've loved uh, hearing your story today on the crackling um please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon really nice to um speak to you anthony this is The Crackling, a Deep in the Weeds production in partnership with Porkstar. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we catch up with some of Australia's best chefs and pork producers to discover what makes Australian pork so special.